Cool. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's everyone doing? Can I get some ones in the box? Can you guys hear me? Can you guys see me? Awesome, mashallah. Oh, welcome, Sister Amal, mashallah. Nawaz, mashallah, welcome, alhamdulillah. I don't know who reconnecting is, but mashallah, um, you're becoming quite famous in our circles, mashallah. <laughs> Everyone else is here, alhamdulillah. Can I get some other ones? Uh, who else is here? Um, uh, Akram is here, reconnecting is here, mashallah. Awesome, mashallah. Welcome all of you, alhamdulillah. I hope that your Ramadans are going well and that you're ready, inshallah, for uh, uh, an intense and wonderful session for today. I hope that you guys have some pen and paper ready for today or your keyboards are handy or your phones are out because inshallah, we are going to be doing some goal setting, inshallah, today and working together. In alhamdulillah, na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ufiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina ma yihdihillahu falamudillala wa ma yudhil falahadiyala wa shadu allah لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد um, how uh, amazing is it, mashallah, to be alive and in the thick of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, that to be sitting and listening to uh, get in a gathering where as you listen and as you sit, the angels are around you, Sakina is descending upon you, and mercy is enveloping you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving you for your sins. How amazing is it to be in a month of Ramadan where you all of these things are happening and they're being multiplied. They're being multiplied and multiplied and as strong as you want it, the more you want forgiveness, the more you want change, the more you want to be a better person, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to your thoughts and your, your hopes, alhamdulillah. So um, this, is a, this is just a wonderful, mashallah, month to have. Uh, I'm very excited, alhamdulillah. I'm very excited. I know that it's nearly, you know, if thought of time for some, but I'm excited because mashallah, we have an opportunity once again to connect and to benefit ourselves in Ramadan. And I want us to, inshallah, do that together, bidnillahi ta'ala. So let's, keep, let's move straight into it. Last week, I spoke about um, the topic of taqwa, the topic of taqwa. And who can remind me? Who can remind me what the purpose of Ramadan is? Who can remind me what the purpose of Ramadan is? I can write that in the box, inshallah. And then the next question is, who can remind me, who can explain to me what that concept is, what that concept is? And so, as we had mentioned last week, the purpose of Ramadan, the purpose of fasting, the purpose of fasting, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 183, Ya amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala alladhina min qabalikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe fasting has been ordained upon you as it has been ordained upon those before you, so that you may attain taqwa. And if you remember, we discussed taqwa and we gave it many different definitions. The major one was that we take actions in our life in order to prevent and to protect ourselves from pain. And what is this pain? Allah's anger. So we act a certain way in order to avoid ourselves from pain. And we gave the example, The person that is walking in a field of thorns. You guys remember the example? A person that is walking in a field of thorns, how do they go about this, this journey? They're very careful, very, very, very particular about every motion they make. And this, brothers and sisters, is a beautiful analogy of taqwa, of taqwa. So moving on now, what we're going to cover today, bi ta'ala, and I know that we have Brother Fazl also in the box, so we're going to also pick on him, alhamdulillah. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the major factor in Ramadan, major game changer in Ramadan is your intention. As the Prophet ﷺ taught us, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. Verily, every action are, is judged based on its intention. And every person shall have what they intended. So everything in our life comes down to this intention. This intention is the most critical part. So the question I have for you guys right now is, number one, are, is your intention, we, we're not going to discuss is your personal intention, but number one, make sure that you know that your intention is for the sake of Allah, that you're fasting and whatnot there. But I want us to go a little bit further here, and I want you to ask, I want to ask you guys when it comes to Ramadan. Now that we know what it is, I want you guys to list some things that you're doing in Ramadan, either a good habit that you're doing in Ramadan or a bad habit that you're breaking or you're stopping in Ramadan. So, what is something that you guys are doing in Ramadan that is special, that is new, that's something that's you know you're excited about, you've been doing it, or you have a goal or something? So, tell me something that you guys are doing in Ramadan that you were not doing necessarily before, or something that you stopped doing in Ramadan. So for somebody, for somebody, they might be, for example, reciting Quran now more than they did before. I want to see that in the box, inshallah. 
reading the Quran after each prayer. Okay, excellent, Michelle, give me something a little bit more than that. Is there a specific amount that you're reading, um, reconnecting? Um, this is beautiful though, mashallah. Is there a specific amount that you're reading after every prayer? Um, if so, mention that, inshallah. We'd love to hear. I started with a juz a day with translation each day, alhamdulillah. Finished reviewing everything in the Quran that I forgot. Excellent. Around 5 to 10. Mashallah, good. Very, very good, alhamdulillah. Anyone else want to throw another thing in? It doesn't, uh, and you can add a second one. It's not just one goal. Is there any other things that you guys are doing during Ramadan? Any other goals? Any other habits that you're building, that you're doing? Um, uh, more dhikr? Are you praying more rakahs at night? Do you have a specific goal? Like, I want to read this many rakahs at night. Qiyam al-Layl, very good. Fazl, is there a number that you're trying to hit every night? Is there some magical number here? Or is it just, yani, whatever happens? And we're not going to put you in a fiqh check here. Very good, right? Controlling my anger, talking nicely. If I have a little brother, sister, whatnot, I'm trying not to basically, you know, take it out on them. Learn more dua. Very good. Five rakahs at the very least, alhamdulillah. Okay, cool. I'm sure he is including witr there, or else we'd have some trouble if he's just praying five rakahs straight, right? That's still going to be a problem, folks. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Okay, excellent, mashallah. So when it comes to intentions now, and I want to hear some bad habits, what are some things that you guys have cut down? Something that you cut down on in Ramadan? More conscious about what I do in general? Okay, so Raid is the one who mentioned something right away. Anger, very good, alhamdulillah. What's another thing that you guys have cut down on? Eating, okay. So Zahran, I, I hope that's specifically like you're trying to cut down. So I'm talking about not because you can't eat, yani, but is there something that you're specifically like, for example, you're eating less, you're dieting, then that's fine, inshallah. But what's something that you're cutting down on? Is anybody cutting down on video games, on TV, on movies, on Netflix, on social media? Post it in the box, inshallah. What are you cutting down on? Um, not really. Okay, alhamdulillah. That's, that's okay. That's fine, mashallah. But who is cutting down on it? There's some people, mashallah, that are here and they told me that Umar, in Ramadan, I don't watch any TV. Like I just cut, it was, you know, cold turkey. Some people, mashallah, have left WhatsApp groups and they've turned off their Facebook and whatnot because of Ramadan. Some people have done that. Yeah, balancing social media and other things like studying. Excellent, mashallah. So um, now that we've kind of gone over a couple goals, I want you to now look at these goals. And one of the major things people say, one of the major challenges people have, and this is where we're going to have our discussion today. They say, Omar, in Ramadan, I had all these great goals. I felt like a different person. But outside of Ramadan, <laughs> I'm a different person. Okay, I'm a different fuzzle. Okay, like there's the Ramadan fuzzle. He looks a certain way. He might even, you know, his beard gets a couple more inches on it. You know, um, you know, there's the, the, the Ramadan sister Amal, her hijab gets a couple feet longer, whatever it may be. And then there's the after Ramadan fuzzle, right? And this is a person that, you know, um, is now back to the normal ways or back to this or that. So the question that I have to you all, and people, they start feeling this way. After Ramadan, it's like one of the major times of depression. So you know when this COVID things happened, everyone was getting depressed. Everybody was freaking out. Everybody was really sad. And then Ramadan came and everyone was like, well, at least we're alive. Alhamdulillah. There's going to be a big dip. And I want you all to understand this. Because it's important to understand, right? We don't just learn. We understand as Muslims. There's going to be a huge dip after Ramadan. Why? Because people are not going to be doing the same worship that they're doing. They're not going to feel the same connection. And it's going to bother them. So the question I have for you all, and I'd love to hear some insights. Why do you think after Ramadan is not the same as during Ramadan? Why do you think after Ramadan we have this breakdown? We have this thing where we fall back into all of our bad habits. What do you think the reason is, folks? And this is going to be our discussion for today. So if you already know the answer, then alhamdulillah, you can mute me for the rest of the call. Why do you think after Ramadan is so hard? Because we think we're only supposed to do good in Ramadan. Very good, very good point. Any else, what, what else do you guys want to say? What else do you want to say here? We prepare only for the formality. Part of it could be because our goals are maybe not sustainable. Excellent, alhamdulillah. Very, very good, mashallah. Very, very good. These are great answers, mashallah. You guys have permission to leave, mashallah. All of you, alhamdulillah. That's good. I hope you stick around though. But mashallah, this is awesome answers here, alhamdulillah. So what are the major things that happen? And let's break it down very logically. We have a people that basically say, every day in Ramadan, I'm going to read two juz of Quran or one juz, 20 pages of Quran. And they do all these great goals. And then Ramadan ends. And they have no goal for after Ramadan. Their after Ramadan goal is, I'm just going to try and keep things up. Do you guys hear that sometimes? What are you going to do after Ramadan, guys? I'll try and, you know, read some Quran. In Ramadan, you knew exactly how much Quran you're reading. After Ramadan, it becomes some Quran. All right? In Ramadan, you're like, I'm not going to get mad. You know, I'm going to get mad once a week at my little sister. You know, that once a week, you're like, it was in my goals. 
after Ramadan, it's like, I'll, I'll try and be better. And we usually fall back into it. In Ramadan, it becomes, I'm going to watch zero TV. And after Ramadan, it becomes, well, I did good in Ramadan. It was always next year. You know, those 30-day challenges. We treat Ramadan like it's a 30-day workout, a 30-day challenge where you just complete the challenge. You get this little sticker, you know, and you're like, yay, Ramadan. And then subhanAllah, you wonder why we feel so sad, why we crash down, why we return to sin, why we can't keep up the good habits. It's because we made a mistake in the way that we plan things out. One of the things that I do, brothers and sisters, and I want you guys to do this, inshallah, when I prepare my goals for Ramadan, I prepare goals for after Ramadan, and I write it down. So who here has done that? You know, definitely, mashallah, you guys are doing great. For those that have not done that, this is the time now. So I want you guys to basically focus and think, what are things I'm going to do after Ramadan? And someone's like, Omar, why? Why do we care about after Ramadan? <laughs> and this is exactly the problem. Because we think that the whole month, as Raid said very beautifully, we think that this is all about Ramadan. Somebody will come and they'll tell me that my, you know, Omar, I'm not watching TV. And I ask them, why? Why are you not watching TV? You know, there's a new episode of such and such on. Did you not catch this series? Did you not catch this update? And they'll say, Omar, I'm not watching TV because it's Ramadan. And I see someone reading Qur'an and they're reading Qur'an beautifully. And I say, mashallah, why are you reading so much Qur'an? And they say, Omar, I'm reading so much Qur'an because it's Ramadan. And then, you know, if he goes a little bit further, you say, brother, what, what happened? You used to be talking to all these girls. What happened to you? He says, oh, it's Ramadan. You know, I took, I took it off. Alhamdulillah, I broke up with my girlfriend. Oh, mashallah, that's great. I stopped smoking. I stopped doing this. I stopped doing that. I stopped watching bad things. I stopped lying. And then you're like, really? You're like, well, I tried, you know, a little bit. And they say all of these things because it's Ramadan. And everyone's like, mashallah, Umar, there's no problem with that. What's wrong with that? And the problem with that, brothers and sisters, is that as soon as, you know, May 25th hits in or May 24th hits in, and somebody now is asking them, hey, Ra'id, hey, you know, Fazl, why aren't you reading Qur'an? Why aren't you reading Qur'an anymore? The answer is, it's not Ramadan. Why aren't you praying Salah? Well, it's not Ramadan. And you might not say that with your words. But subhanAllah, in the way that you planned your Ramadan, you set yourself up for that failure. If you do things for Ramadan only, reading Qur'an, praying Salah, being nice, this, this, because it's Ramadan, the moment it becomes not Ramadan anymore, you've not changed. You go right back into your same bad habits. If you only read Qur'an because it's Ramadan, your intention is wrong. Why? Because subhanAllah, isn't, doesn't Allah exist throughout the whole year? Doesn't Allah exist eternally? Doesn't the rules of Islam exist throughout the whole year? You have to pray Fajr whether it's Ramadan or not, right or wrong. But when someone says, oh, well, I pray Fajr now. Why? Because it's Ramadan. That's why I do it. Yani, is Fajr fought in Ramadan only or throughout the year? Right? That girl, is she, you know, is it haram for you to be with her in Ramadan or throughout the whole year? And people now start saying, okay, now you got a point. And this is the main challenge, brothers and brothers and sisters, is that people have become people that just change for Ramadan. And this is a really, really scary thing. This is a really scary thing because what ends up happening is when you change for Ramadan, you'll change back for the same reasons. That's number one. And so the point I want to give across to everybody is when it comes to your Ramadan goals, set goals for after Ramadan, after Ramadan. These habits need to be shifted. Does everyone understand? Can I get some ones in the box? Are we good with this? Setting goals for after Ramadan and basically look and see, do these now link together? Do these link together? Does it make sense? Okay, now number two, let's talk about these goals. Now, if someone has a goal, they're like, Brother Omar, you know, I'll reconnect. You said something really beautiful. You said that one of my goals is that I, uh, one of my goals for Ramadan is that I read Quran every day after Salah, five, 10 pages, you know, 10, 20 minutes, whatever it may be. So if I were to ask you, what's your goal for after Ramadan? Many people will say, I want to do the same thing. I want to keep reading Quran five to 10 pages after every Salah. Does this make sense? All right, can I get some ones in the box? Does this make sense? Very good, very good. Now, there's a problem with that. And some people say, I want to even go higher after Ramadan. There's a problem with that, brothers and sisters. There's a problem with that. One of the major reasons why we're so good in Ramadan is not just because we put our mental fix into it. That's part of it, the psychology of Ramadan. Everybody's praying, so I pray, right? When everyone's not praying, it's hard to pray. When everyone's not fasting, it's hard to fast. When everybody is not reading Quran in your house, it's hard to. When the whole world is not shut down and focusing on Qur'an, Qur'an, Qur'an and hadith and prayers and fasting and goodness and this, it's hard to do that for yourself. So there is a psychology aspect that after Ramadan is not going to be there. Sorry. 
it's going to be a different environment. But there's another aspect that we talked about in the first speech, which is that Ramadan also has a spiritual benefit. It also has a special barakah that's in the month of Ramadan that doesn't exist outside of it. And I need everyone to understand that. It's not some fluke that you're doing so well in Ramadan that your people are quitting things and abandoning sins. Allah has blessed you. Shaitan has slowed down. The world has changed. Everything is different in this month. For you to think that that barakah at the same level is going to be there afterwards, it's not a smart idea. It's not a smart idea. Similarly, so when you set goals after Ramadan, understand that your goals in Ramadan should be a little bit higher. Does that make sense, everybody? Your goals in Ramadan should be a little bit higher. If after Ramadan you want to pray two rakah qiyam al-layl every single night, in Ramadan you should be knocking out four, six, eight, a little bit more. If you want to read a juz every day outside of Ramadan, inside Ramadan your goal should be a little bit higher. As you know, people are stronger in Ramadan than stronger again in the last 10 nights. And then you talk about Laylatul Qadr and subhanAllah, you'll see that people are reading so much Quran then. And there's no problem with that. There's no problem in pushing yourself harder when there's more motivation, when there's more barakah, when there's more energy. It's normal, it's natural. But the reality is if you want to be a Muslim that really benefits from Ramadan, plan for after Ramadan. That will teach you to make your goals in Ramadan to be realistic and for you to take it up a notch in Ramadan. It will also help you deal with the fact that you might drop a bit after Ramadan. So for some people, their basically goals are that, you know, Amar, I wanna, you know, basically, um, a good one, I wanna cut off TV. It's a bad habit of mine. I wanna stop watching TV or stop watching Netflix, okay? Now, what happens is we set a goal that's a bit too high in Ramadan. We say, I'm gonna go cold turkey. Before, let's say you used to watch three hours a day, right? Three hours, four hours a day. Let's say three hours, because we're nice people. You go from three to zero. After Ramadan, what's going to happen? Are you really going to stay zero? Or is that TV show, that itch, that this, that this going to come out to you? And so subhanAllah, what I would recommend is after Ramadan, set a goal that's lower than three. Does that make sense? So if you watch three hours right now, say that I'm only going to watch two hours or one hour. Let's say even two hours. I'm fine with that. That's my change. So in Ramadan now, that doesn't mean you need to have a goal of zero hours. And if you do, great, mashallah. But I'm the type of person that says, no, take the goal after Ramadan, two hours. Bring it into Ramadan and, you know, make it better to go further. So what's better than two hours? 30 minutes, one hour, 20 minutes, you know? And so now, subhanAllah, through Ramadan, throughout Ramadan, you're still doing it. Yeah, and you're still doing a habit that's not the best. But your goal is, I'm improving. I'm improving. And in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's critical. In the eyes of you being a better Muslim, that's critical. Just moving forward. You might not be someone that can read all 12 rak'ah sunnahs every single day. You know, the extra ones, two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr. But when you're doing things for after Ramadan, when you're looking at the bigger picture, if before Ramadan, you did not even pray your five times salah, then during Ramadan, you're doing five times salah, 12 rak'ah sunnah, eight rak'ah qiyam al-layl, and there's an extra two here and there. Where's the, where's the goal for afterwards? You're going to fall hard. So instead of making such large goals, say after Ramadan, I want to go from praying maybe once or twice a day to five times a day. So in Ramadan, I'm going to pray five times a day and I'm going to take it up a notch. I'm going to add two rakahs, four rakahs. I'm going to add a little bit of this, a little bit of that. What's going to happen after Ramadan? I'll just go back to basically a better state. So when you're looking at your goals, brothers and sisters, always, and when you're looking, because it's 10 days we're in, we got 20 more days. This is the best time. I like to reassess my goals either every week or every 10 days. So I hope you guys will do the same. I like to look at where was I before Ramadan? Where do I want to be after Ramadan? And then how can I give that little jump up here? Give myself a little boost. Can I get some ones in the box? Does this make sense? And as Reconnected said, you're going to burst out. Yeah, for sure. If you go from like watching four hours of TV to nothing, and you think after Ramadan, you're going to go back to nothing, this is very rare. And if you think that you're going to do that with every act of worship, maybe for TV, you'll do it. But you think that your salah will be the same, your qiyam will be the same, your Quran will be the same, your dhikr will be the same, the amount of time you spend with your family, the amount of money you donate, do you think it's all going to be the same? No. The reality, brothers and sisters, is Ramadan is training you. You might give money every single day in Ramadan, Give money every week outside of Ramadan. That's a goal. And so you want to think of the picture that imagine a person goes through Ramadan now. Three hours they're watching Netflix and movies and YouTube and TV. During Ramadan, they do 30 minutes or an hour. Let's say one hour. 
after Ramadan, they do two hours. Let's keep playing the line, guys. What's going to happen when they get to next Ramadan? They're at two hours. What's their new goal going to be? Inshallah, one hour. What's that Ramadan going to be like? 30 minutes. If they're successful, what's the next year going to look like? One hour? Zero. Do you see how you can walk yourself through realistic changes into your habits? Long changes into your habits. Because inshallah, may Allah bless you guys with great and long and prosperous and safe lives. And lives of good and khair. But inshallah, look at this as a long game. Everything we're doing is slowly building habits. You might hear people say, Omar, you should recite a juz a day for the rest of your life. And this is a beautiful recommendation that many people do. They recite a juz a day, they finish a Quran every single month. You might need three years to get to that pace, brothers and sisters, no problem. But do yourself the favor of setting your Ramadan schedule up so after Ramadan, you have a goal set up that makes sense, that helps you get there. A goal of improvement. And so I want you guys to all look back in. I'm going to scroll up and see some of the goals that we have written here. And I'm going to make some comments, inshallah. Somebody said that they basically want to read Quran after each prayer. So this is a beautiful goal. Let's keep it going. So after Ramadan, you might say, I want to read Quran after two salahs a day. You understand how you've taken it down a bit, but this is consistency. This is weekends. This is work days. This is during school. This is I, every day, two salahs. I'm going to stick to that. I'm going to keep reading Quran after. And the amount you might read a lot now, maybe the same amount, right? No problem. Maybe a little less. But again, the key is at least set that minimum because some days you're going to go above it. Some days it's going to be hard to maintain. And that's why we remember the Prophet said that the best and most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the small deeds. The small deeds, but that are done consistently. Right? Revising the Quran, mashallah. Someone like Raid is revising, mashallah, memorizing, mashallah, great. So with revision, same thing. If you spend your whole Ramadan only revising Quran every year and the rest of the year, it becomes forgotten. And I think a lot of us know that. Even ones that aren't Hafad, we know that our Juzamma, we knew some surahs before. We knew some Wadduhas and some Lam Yakuns and this and that. And now, if you look at us, we're like, no, we just spent our whole days. All our year round was what? Our Ramadan, we're doing all these different surahs. But the year round, we're sticking to the three calls. And if we're really feeling fancy, we'll throw in an idha ja. You know what I'm saying, guys? And so this is basically our consistent schedule throughout the year. Make a change, brothers and sisters. In Ramadan, learn and utilize all those surahs from Wadduha down, mashallah. That's a great amount of surahs, about 20 of them there. And let's make a goal that after Ramadan, in every rakah, I'm going to read one of these surahs. I'm not going to lose it. So that when I get to next year's Ramadan, <laughs> I'll at least have wadduha down, you know, and I'll be comfortable with them. And then I'll go next level, next level, next level. And this is where the wisdom comes in, mashallah. Uh, Sister Amma, she said, mashallah, that she's in a situation where she's trying to uh, read and do translation. The question I ask you guys is, what's the goal afterwards? What's the goal afterwards? Inshallah, how are you going to keep this up? Is this something that you should just read translation once for the Quran or read the Quran once? Maybe, Sister Amal, what you're going to do after Ramadan is cut down to five pages of translation a day. Maybe what you're going to do after Ramadan is to do one page of tafsir, read one page of an explanation of the Qur'an every day. What it may be, it'll lead you somewhere so that your Ramadan is building you up, inshallah, so that next Ramadan, you, this year you might have done translation, next year you might do uh, tafsir, you might do something deeper, right? And so you want to always ask yourself, what's the bigger goal? Dear brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you for a second. So many people, they say in Ramadan, you need to read the whole Qur'an. And I think uh, Sheikh Ahmed talked about this, I think in one of the Q&As. You need to read the whole Qur'an. People say this all the time. I want to ask you a question. And I want someone to answer this. Why do you read the whole Qur'an in Ramadan? What's the reason? What does it get you? Tell me what it gets you. Someone tell me. So, okay, if you're wrong, just take a shot at it, inshallah. I got time. Right, Fazl, we got time? We got time. Nobody, nobody wants that. Everyone's scared of me now. See, Fazl, this is why, this is what happens. This is why the attendance drops. Everyone gets scared. Um, SubhanAllah, we are in the dip part of Ramadan. We are in the dip part, alhamdulillah. Exactly, 15 minutes. Yeah, you're, you're checking on the chart, right? Alhamdulillah. Okay, cool. So basically, we have 15 minutes left, folks. So... 
what I want to tell you is basically people read the whole Quran in Ramadan. They make this huge thing about it. They make a huge thing about it. And there's merit in reading the Quran and there's merit with reading the Quran in Ramadan. I'm not saying there isn't. But subhanAllah, Ramadan is a month about personal benefit. This is most the most critical thing about Ramadan is how are you going to be a better person closer to Allah? Taqwa, right? When you read a juz a day, when you read the whole Quran, does it increase your taqwa? Does it make you feel closer to Allah? Or do you feel like you're just in a robotic race, just trying to hit a goal, just trying to finish to the finish line because everyone else does, because there's blessing. And the blessing is there, brothers and sisters. I'm not going to, let's not forget about the blessing. You know, um, the Prophet ﷺ said that if a person reads Quran, that he gets reward for each letter. And in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that there is 10 rewards written for every letter. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us that if, the, if you're reading a word like alif, lam, meme, alif is a letter, lam is a letter, meme is a letter. Can I get some ones? Have we heard this hadith before? The merit of reciting Quran. 10 times this is during the year. This is during the year. So during Ramadan, it's going to be much higher, right? Let me give you a small statistic because a lot of people don't know this. Does anybody know how many words are on a page? Take a guess. What do you guys think? How many, sorry, not words, letters. How many letters are on a page of a mushaf? You can technically Google it, but I want you to know, anyone want to take a guess? What do you guys think the number is? Number of letters on a page. Fuzzle, use your big brain here. What do you think? I want to hear some answers, mashallah. People are quiet. Let's do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, training ground, mashallah, great, great fuzzle. Well, give me, give me the numbers. How many letters do you think are on a page of the Quran? Ballpark, yes. 5,000, 100, 1,350. Such, that's such a particular answer. I love it. Alhamdulillah, Zahran. Wonderful. I think about 500. Okay, fuzzle. I'm going to say you're wrong just because I like to make you wrong. But that was, I was going to go with something like that. Alhamdulillah. Mouthur is here, mashallah. So there's roughly 500 to 600 letters per page. Now, every page is a little bit different. As you guys know, those are the memorized Quran. You're like, why is this page harder than the other? Sometimes the words are squished. The font is smaller. And you're like, man, this is tough. But roughly speaking, we're looking at about 500 to 600 letters uh, per page. And there are some exceptions, but that's rough. So now if we're talking about 500 letters, brothers and sisters, how much reward are we talking about for one page of the Quran? The Prophet said every letter is 10. That's 5,000. 5,000 rewards written in your name. Now in Ramadan, everything is multiplied. Everything is multiplied. 10, 70, 700 times. Even if we were to say that it would be multiplied 70 times, brothers and sisters. Anyone want to give me that number, that quick math there? 350,000 rewards. 300, I will write it in the box. All right, check the zeros. 350,000 rewards for reading one page of the Quran, inshallah, with getting 10 rewards, then getting the Ramadan multiplier of 70. Wow. So now you might be like, Omar, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm just going to read Quran for the rest of the month. That's good enough for me. Alhamdulillah. One, and I'm reading the whole thing, 600 pages. Multiply that by 604 pages. Or those of you that actually know how many words are in the Quran, multiply. You can see the reward is there. The reward is there. And I want you to push for reward for sure, guys. For sure, brothers and sisters. But I also want you to be the Muslims that are practical. Because the Prophet ﷺ taught us that the Muslims that are practical, the Muslims that do things to change, to benefit, these are the ones that will get greater reward, and these are the ones that will be consistently rewarded. Do you really want to recite the Qur'an this year in Ramadan and that's it? Or do you want to be amongst the people that recite the Qur'an throughout the year? And next Ramadan recite more Qur'an. Ask yourself the question, who do you want to be? And when you do things in Ramadan, if you do them just for the reward, when Ramadan leaves, now this extra multiplier is gone. So your reward leave. But if you do it for the sake of Allah, for the sake of change, for the sake of self-betterment, you will see yourselves always going further, further, further. You don't get caught up in the glamour of just going for the reward only. But you start asking yourself, how many years have I read the Qur'an and how many years have I cried because of the beauty of the Qur'an? And you ask yourself, which, which should I be going after? 350,000, you know, some people offer you a million dollars, mashallah, and this is a reward, this is good stuff. But if you unlock your heart and you teach yourself something that will benefit you, it will give you blessings for a lifetime. It'll be something you'll teach your family, your friends, your kids. It'll make you, it'll teach you something that will give you the tools to deal with life. 
the Prophet ﷺ, he read Qur'an not for the reward. He read the Qur'an not for the reward, but because he loved to hear Allah's words. He loved to listen to what Allah was telling him. He loved to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would you rather love being with Allah or love the reward? So ask yourself, brothers and sisters, am I reading so hard and so fast and so methodical, methodical that I'm not, I'm not feeling it? What can I do to feel this Ramadan in 20 days, 19 days that are left, in 18 days that are left? Sister Amal says, I read translation. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm not saying don't read Quran, but I'm saying find the thing that will benefit you this Ramadan because you have that barakah, you have that energy. Some people for the Qiyam al layl they're, mashallah, just praying as much as they can and other people are focusing on making du'as and sajda, taking it really slow. I've never enjoyed salah. It's always been a chore. I just go up and down, up and down. Be a person that feels the positions and starts connecting to Allah through the salah, through learning what you're saying, through doing something to help people. Make this Ramadan a Ramadan in which you build not only good habits, but you build real change in your life. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ taught us to do that which benefits you, that amongst the permissible things. That which gives you the greatest benefit. Because brothers and sisters, Ramadan, and I want to say this again, it is not a month that is meant to be just achieving blessings. It is a month that is meant to be a month of change. That's why taqwa is the key. Getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just knowing Allah exists, so therefore I read Quran, therefore I pray five times a day. But when's the last time that you prayed out of love? When they said the companions would pray the salah, they said that when they would come upon the third and the fourth rak'ah, that they would become sad. We're happy when we get to the end of that rak'ah, especially the Maghrib Salah. Imam, if you recite anything longer than the three quls, you're out. New Imam next day, right? Next sun takes over. Quickest Salah possible, we got food ready. We got biryani cooking, you know what I'm saying? But subhanAllah, the companions were sad when they got to the end of Salah because they knew that this great connection, Salah is from the word Sila. Sila, it means a chain or a connection. And the Prophet ﷺ said in one beautiful hadith that when a person prays Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly looks and stares at his servant. Imagine this image that you pray salah and imagine that everything turns dark around you. And there's a light that connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just watching his servant. And the Prophet says that he keeps watching his servant through all of his motions, through all of the prayer. Watching, subhanAllah, admiring this servant that's praying to him. Only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we pray, not because our parents told us to, not because it's Ramadan. And he's watching his servant and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely focused on this servant as the servant prays. And he says in the hadith, until the, until the servant finishes their salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not break that connection. What does that mean? We are the ones that break away from Allah. We're the ones that decide it's going to end, this beautiful moment, this beautiful experience. And this is why way back then the philosophers had a discussion, the philosophers had a debate, and they discussed this. These are Muslim philosophers talking about things, and non-Muslims, and they basically were discussing the nature of human. And if I remember, I told you guys that we have two natures. And they said that when it comes to this salah, this prayer, it is the strangest thing we see. Because we see people that are humans, but when they get into salah, they turn into this, this spirit, they have spiritual experiences. They have these spiritual experiences when they're reading Quran, when they're praying Salah. Then it's so interesting that throughout the day, they're humans and then they have these spiritual experiences. And the Muslim scholars, they said, Kalla, no, you guys don't understand. We are spiritual creatures. And throughout life, we have the odd human experience. But we as Muslims are not these humans. Yani, we're human beings. We are spiritual in our nature. Our hearts and our souls, they, they seek and they desire the connection to their Lord. They seek and they desire connection to goodness. We love it. 
the way that every the way that Ramadan changes people, brothers and sisters, the way that Ramadan, you'll find people that don't pray salah and they're crying. They're crying, crying as the Imam is reciting and making dua. They're crying more than you or I, and you're like, what's up with this? Allah chooses in these pillars. We said Ramadan is a pillar. In every pillar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses ways to liven the hearts and the souls. These are part of the deep wisdoms of Salah, of Siyam, of Hajj. And it's us, brothers and sisters, that start experiencing these things in Ramadan. And then we tell ourselves, oh, it's just because it was Ramadan. It's a special moment. We're not going to feel it again. Why can't I feel it throughout the year? Because you treated Ramadan as the way a human would. Just calculating, calculating. I need to read this many pages, this, this. And it's great to set goals. But when's the last time you turn the clock off? You turn the page counter off. You turn the dhikr beads, whatever, however you turn them off. And you just said, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. And reflected and thought, what am I doing? What is my tongue saying? Not how many trees did I build in paradise, which is great. But how great is my Lord? That we say, Allahu Akbar. That he's created everything. That he's made everything. That he's given us the blessing of Ramadan that he controls and takes care of the whole world. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say to you is, when it comes to Ramadan, I'm going to conclude with saying this, the two points from what you got out today. Number one, look at your goal before Ramadan. Look at what, make goals for after Ramadan, i.e. look at where you were before Ramadan. Look at where you want to be after Ramadan and ask yourself the deep question, am I getting there? Or am I just running around in a circle? Doing great deeds, the reward inshallah will be written if your intention is good. But am I really getting anywhere through my Ramadan? Allah giving, is giving you a chance, guys, to be something great, to experience something special, to unlock something that you're looking to unlock, that your heart and soul want to feel and want to unlock. Are you going to let your heart dictate this Ramadan? Or are you going to let the factors around you, the hype, the psychology, the way that people rush after things, the same way we look to beat everybody, competitions of this, of that, don't make Ramadan a competition of numbers. And I remind you of, a, of, the, of the statement of the companions when they said that when it comes to Abu Bakr, why was he the best? They said Abu Bakr did not beat us because of the amount of worship or the amount of rakahs or the amount of Qur'an or the amount of this or the amount of that, that's not why he beat us. He beat us because there was something in his heart. There was something strong in his heart that every action he did, it made him stronger, it made him happier, it made him better. Some of us brothers and sisters, when we pray salah, all we get is a mini workout. We don't get closer to Allah. When Allah says that the salah in the salat tanha an al fahsha'i wal munkar, it protects you, it takes you away from the evil and the lewdness and whatnot. Some of us, we only get from our fasting, brothers and sisters, a month of hunger, potential weight loss, as the brother said, I just ate less this year. This is what this one month. That's all I do is I eat less. Some of us, we only get food, we only get hunger and thirst. We only get hunger and thirst. And we miss out on what really we're supposed to be getting. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لسائر المسلمين كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. There will be an Instagram Q and A with my colleague uh, Sheikh Adnan is going to be there. So ask him questions about balance, uh, and uh, Sheikh Ahmed is going to be there. Um, just ask him questions about funny things because Mashallah he's a wonderful person. Alhamdulillah. And I would like to pass it on if uh, Sheikh Ahmed is ready. I know we have a couple seconds left. Mashallah. Oh, he is ready, and the papers are ready too. Mashallah. Can we see them papers again? Yes, I love, I love the, mashallah, I got to get myself a stack of papers just so I can do that, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, barakallahu feek. Sheikh Ahmed, how are you doing today? How's your fast going? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, it's been great, alhamdulillah. Allahumma lak alhamd. We had, uh, we had a very interesting meeting at work today at Isna, so um, I had to be, I had, I, I, it's my day off, but I was called in and I just made it back just in time for the, the class, alhamdulillah. Well, may Allah SWT bless you. We, we, we benefit greatly from you being here, alhamdulillah, and the angels benefit greatly. So I will hand it over to you. Jazakum Allah khairan. Jazakum Allah khairan, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي For those of you that joined me last week you know what I'm going to ask um, put your game face on and turn on your cameras because I can't talk when I don't see people so I, I kudos to Raid Mir for having the camera on but I, I need to have at least four people uh, before I begin. There we go. Ridla, excellent, mashallah. Zahran, excellent, mashallah. I need, I need one more person to courage up and come up and put on. I think you're good. What do you mean? <laughs> you're good to open or you're good not to open? <laughs> I guess that means you're good not to open. All right, let's see who else has got the courage to actually come and... Uh, uh, one, two, three. I'm just trying to see over here. Uh, so otherwise, if you don't open, then I'll open your cameras. How's that? I think you, I, th I don't think you guys want me to do that, right? No, no, that doesn't count. Put your camera down. Turn off your camera. It doesn't count. It confuses me. <laughs> but that was a good, good that was a good, good attempt. No, Rida, you can't do that. Why'd you turn your camera off? <laughs> okay. So, uh, are you, oh, you, you're just messing with me. This is, this is wrong. You're tripping me out. This is so wrong. You can't do that. All right. I think you guys are, the rest of the people, I understand you guys are fasting. Fasting, Amal, uh, you know, that's not good. Komal, I know who you are. I know, I know. You can put on your camera, inshallah. So, anyhow, at least I see three, three faces so I can communicate and I can do these two thumbs up and, you know, five high fives. To all of you guys, inshallah. How is everyone's fast? Awesome. That's great. So good to know. Everyone is doing good. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Akram, since you said good, let me, let me, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that would be not appropriate, inshallah. Tayyip, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, I'm not dying. <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm dying. I'm, yeah, that, that's great. You know what? Actually, not dying is better than the alternative, right? Like living is really good, right? Like dying is so bad. So just, just stick in there, stick in there. Everything's going to be all right. All right. Today is a very interesting story. We're going to talk about... Uh, <clears throat> so today's story is about two individuals. One is a rich person who is um, a Muslim but he is entrenched in the love of dunya and he has completely forgotten the true purpose of why he is here in this dunya. And another person who is a poor person, but he's like, his reliance is next level. His Iman is next level on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the man of two gardens, right? Oh, somebody actually posted that. Yeah, look at that. You're one step ahead of the game. That's great. So the man of two gardens. Now, the story today is, is very profound because it will give all of us perspective of what we're going through right now. And, and, and I, I don't, I, I, I don't like, I, not just metaphorically, but really, like if you think about it, the, the verses are so profound when it comes to that. So the verses start and we're going to start off verse uh, number 32. Verse number 32, we stopped, we stopped at verse number 31 last time. So those of you that are on your computers, I would suggest that what you can do is you can go to Quran.com and you can open Quran.com and go to verse number 32. Uh, pick your favorite uh, translation. I like Sahih International and I also like uh, Dr. Mustafa Khattab, who's a very good friend of mine. And I think his translation is probably, in my opinion, probably one of the best, if not the best. I would say Sahih International and Dr. Mustafa Khattab are like up there. Um, those are the two best translations that I would recommend for anybody because they're written in simple English, not for English of the grammarians and all the historians and thou art doing good today, that type of English. All right, we start off. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ 
جَنَّتَيْنِ مِنْ أَعْنَابٍ وَحَفَفْنَاهُمَا بِنَخْلٍ وَجَعَلْنَا وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمَا زَرْعًا Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ Strike for them or, or give them an example of two people. جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمْ One of them we made for him جَنَّتَيْنِ Two gardens. The concept of two gardens existed and it still exists till this day. Um, when you go in the Middle East, you're going to find this very prevalent where people will have, for example, big houses and they will have like a, uh, they'll have their own green patch backyard and that backyard is exclusive for the family. So no external family is allowed in that backyard. And then you have a backyard that is like for guests. So that is a specific backyard where the guests come from outside, the food comes from within the house, people enjoy that, and then it, 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 it does not disturb the privacy of the people in the house. So the people living in the house still get to have a garden for themselves. And it's a very common practice in the Middle East. Uh, not like every house, but like any rich person who has that much money, they generally separate their gardens and they call them istirahat, or, or places of rest. And it's very common that they'll have a, a, a wall dividing and the door will open. And then this is a first door. So you'll enter from the street, first door, small garden, then a small door you go through and then another garden that is for the private family. And it's very common. And, and it's in the Quran, many verses talk about that too. So we had two gardens, right? Jannatim min a'nab. So we gave him gardens. And those two gardens, jannatain, he had two gardens, min a'nab from grapes or raisins or, or you know, something related to, to the, the, the family of grapes. Now the garden was not left open like that. Imagine if there was a garden in a field and if there were like a bunch of grapes, right? What would happen in the middle of an open field? There's a, there's a, a small patch of grapes. What's going to happen with that is if a wind comes or something blows, grapes are, you know, they're wine, vines. They can't Hold, they're not trees. They're not going to be able to protect themselves. And we guarded or we surrounded them or we, we, we bordered them. We created a border for them with palm trees. Now, palm trees are so powerful. If you've seen any of those clips of like, you know, uh, Florida uh, storms and stuff like that, go look up Florida storms. You'll find these palm trees on the beach. They're like the winds are 100 miles and they're still standing. So they're very powerful. So it's a sign of protection. And we bordered them with palm trees. And between the two gardens, so imagine this, you have a garden which is surrounded and inside are the grapes. And then there is a next garden. And in between the two gardens, there is, uh, this person has zira. So he has vegetation. So he has, he has like potatoes and carrot and garlic and everything else that you might need to cook. So you have sweet and salty both available for the person. Both of these uh, gardens, both of these gardens, they gave its produce. And, and the, now, how can a produce do zulm? How can a produce transgress or do, do wrong? Think about it. Like Allah is saying, both these gardens gave their produce. And the garden did not do any injustice. Uh, uh, the garden did not do a slight bit of injustice or wrongdoing. What does that mean? This earth, and I, I wanted to ponder on that together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this earth, the mother earth, a very unique you know, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. Why? Because if you don't put any effort in it, it still grows. It grows beautifully. I'm living in Canada, Toronto right now. When I drive in Milton, for example, it's all green. Nobody cultivated it. Spring came. It started growing in itself. Nobody stood there, cultivated it. When spring comes, whether you cultivate it or you don't, it gives you greenery. Whatever was were planted in it, it gives you that without any effort. But if somebody puts effort in it, then it gives a produce that the person requires. And based on the amount of effort, it always gives more. So you, you put in one seed and of watermelon and you get one or two or three watermelon and each watermelon are multiple seeds. So you're, it's not like 
you put in one seed and then the earth gives you one watermelon with one seed, right? Or one watermelon without seed. So watermelon without seed would be injustice or wrongdoing. But watermelon with one seed would be equal. You put in one, you get one. But the, the earth, it never does injustice. So you, you, you put in your effort in this earth and then it gives you back. So it's an example that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is trying to, 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 to allude to. That this earth is standard. Its standard is you give it 10, it gives you 100. لَن تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيَّا وَفَجَّرْنَا خِلَالَهُمَا نَهَرًا Between the two gardens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave that person a nahar or a river or an oasis. So imagine that. So it's not only like the guy owns on both river banks, he owns a garden. And both are his. And the river patch is his. Subhanallah. Like I live by, you know, on Britannia Street, for example. Right when Britannia ends, there is like a house and every time we cross by, I always remember this. And I always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives me a house with a river at the as in the backyard. So there's a person who we buy uh, our, uh, we purchase our eggs from. When we go there, his, his backyard is on the Bronte Creek. Like, so on, like in Toronto, Bronte Creek is a very big, you know, creek. His backyard opens to Bronte Creek. And every time I go there and get eggs, I'm like, oh, Allah, man, give me this house. In this dunya also, I want one like that, but I also want it in Jannah, right? And there's nothing to, to, to you should always aspire to have something like that. There's nothing wrong in that. And then the person, he said, oh, No, the word thamar, it has been translated as fruit, but I think the correct translation, as, as you know, other people have alluded to, is, is, is either gold, silver, or children, progeny, kids. It, the, the fruit over here does not make sense because of the next ayah. But again, some of the scholars, they said, we take the meaning as thamar. Thamar in Arabic language means fruit, and we're going to use it as fruit. It doesn't matter. This is the beauty of Quran, that it can contain the meaning of fruit. It can contain the meaning of thamar, which is gold and silver, which is, you know, your... Uh, uh, the resources you have, and it could also contain the meaning of you as your children. And he had resources. We'll just translate it as resources. He had resources. He had a friend, and he said, He said to his friend, and they were having communication or they were having a conversation. or hiwar is when you are having a dialogue or a communication in which you're trying to get a point across to one another, right? So it's not just a day, hey, what'd you eat for today? I ate samosas. Oh, I'm about to eat watermelon. We're all fasting, but you know, you talk about that. That is not muhawara. Muhawara is like, it's like, do you agree with that particular thing? And the person's like, no, 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 man, I don't agree with that person thing. Like, I, I personally think that, and then you are, are going back and forth to get to a point. So he says, they were having a conversation and we know that the conversation is about his intrinsic love of dunya and this person connected and so the conversation happened and the guy is like look man i believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at you 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 know you, you allah has given you so much why are you in denial of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why do you do this in response to that he said what he said what are you talking about bro i got more wealth like i'm more lit that's wrong word by the way it doesn't apply here but I just had to drop it in. Uh, I am more, like in our arrows, I, I, I have money. I, I'm more dope. Like I got more money and I, I have more sw swag, whatever you want to call it. And they're having saying, Ana aksaru min you know, I, I got the bling bling. And I got, I got a whole clan at the back. You know, the Wu-Tang Clan. Wu-Tang Clan was, was, was very, uh, very cool when I was growing up. It no longer exists, you know, so. You know how old I am now. That person, after he said this to this person, entered his garden. And he had done zulm on his self. How does a person do zulm on his own self? Question for you guys. How do you do zulm on yourself? You can unmute your mic if you want and talk. How do you do zulm on yourself? Come on, unmute. You're unmuted. Well, a person can do zulm on themselves, like, you know, when they 
when they think of themselves they're too high like when they think too high of themselves you know, like okay good good so when a person thinks of himself above what he's he is right so he's like oh i'm i'm above everything i'm like uh, so very, very close so the person he says you know man i got all of this man i got resources i got education i got a better best education i'm living in canada you know and all of that and being too proud yeah you can do zulm uh, by being too proud of yourself now now the way we transcribe ourselves is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has created our nafs and there's two types right there is nafs tashtahi there's a nafs nafs that wants desires so it's all you know i want desire 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 so it's all about desires and there's another nafs that you know the, the the ulama they've described it and i'll say it in arabic and you guys can and then I try, I'll, I'll try and attempt it to translate it in, in in english for you guys it says it is the tranquility that the the, the nafs attains by getting close to the innate nature of human being right so either i have desires and these desires may not be the best so these desires may not be the best things that i can do so these desires are primarily what desires that may uh want uh, uh you know uh, that might not be good for myself or my nafs but in that case allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a person what is what is what does 35 mean oh okay sorry i'm not reading the rest of the comments i just see the 35 i'm like desires 35 like what's going on right so you can have desires and those desires um are sometimes most of the times they're evil and then there are other things if we fulfill them which is the obedience to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then our fi our our set our soul finds tranquility and we find very comfort in it every time we give preference to our desires over the preference of what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked from us that's when we do zulm to ourselves so every time allah says wake up in fajr and we're like desire sleep in the bed it's so warm it's very nice okay that's where you give in preference to your your nafs so you want to sleep no 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 allah says wake up when we do that then our our nafs is going to feel comforted because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that and that is close to our fitra or that is close to our innate disposition or nature our nature then the person says wa dakhala jannatahu wa huwa zalimun li nafsi li nafsi qala ma adhanu ma aghunu anta bida hadhihi abada he entered his garden wa huwa zalimun li nafsi and he had transgressed upon himself and in this particular context he had transgressed upon himself because all of these thoughts were in his head the ones that he expressed ana aktharu minka i got money money is great as long as i got power i'm doing great zalimun li nafsihi and then he entered and he had transgressed himself qal he said now he expresses his belief now ma adhun and ma adhunu an tabida hadhihi abada i do not believe and i don't I, i like i have i have almost certainty and i think that all of this that i have will never perish ever and tabida hadhihi abada this money of mine like i have it so much there's no way it's there's not enough world left in it to be perished then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa ma adhunu an as-sa'ata qa'imatun wa la irdittu ila rabbi la ajidanna khayran minha munqalaba so he says and i also i'm i'm, I'm really sure that as-sa'a ma adhunu as-sa'a qa'ima i don't think I, i'm pretty sure that qiyama or the hour is not going to happen but let, let's see if it does happen if it does happen wa la irdit and if it does happen ولا ارددت الى ربي اي شال ريتيرن باك تو ماي رب خيرا منقلبا اي شال ريتيرن باك تو ماي رب اند وين اي جو باك تو هيم اي ويل فايند سمثينغ فار بيتر اوت كم ذان وات اي ام ان رايت ناو قال له صاحبه هيز بيرسون هي سايز خيرا منقلبا قال له صاحبه هيز بيرسون هي سايز هيز فريند صاحب وهو يحاوره ذا بيرسون اي جيس ذي هاف انذر ميتينغ ناو he said all of this and they're having another meeting and in this meeting he says wa huwa yuhawiru now his friend is trying to convince him akafarta billadhi khalaqaka min turab thumma min nutfa thumma sawaka rajul ya now notice in the in the previous word previous verse how do we know this person was a muslim because he says wala irudittu ila rabbi if i return back to my rabb so he knows that allah is his rabb he is not a kafir he is not a mushrik like he is he 
He says, "Wala iruditu ila Rabbi." I, you know, all he just says is like, "I don't believe that you know Khiyama is going to happen." Like, you know, I, I, I doubt it. I doubt. It. I believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He's my Rabb. La, and he believes in Akhira. He believes that there will be, you know, this this day when I die, there will be Akhira. He just says, "I, I, you know, Dunya has entrenched him so much that he's he's starting to have doubts about Qiyama ever happening happening." But he says, in the case that this happens, that I'm in a good side. Because if I go back to my Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I'll be okay. So that's why his friend now in this response to him, he says, Because he believed in him being a Rabb, and Rabb is a Khaliq, the one who creates from nothing and takes them to, perf takes their thing to perfection. Uh, can't Lord be anyone though? So how do we know here it means Allah? It's from the context, context, right? So the Lord could be anyone, but in specifically, we know from the, the context over here that there is no other Rabb that this can go back to. For example, in Surah Yusuf, you can have Rabb and it can go back to Yusuf alayhi salam's, uh, the minister, who was like, so he was a slave of that minister. So it could go to him or it could go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second, very good question. How do we know about these meanings? The, the ulama or the mufassirun, they have described it in detail. So if there happens to be two meanings of that rub, then you will find in multiple translations that it was translated in two different ways. I hope that you answer that. قَالَ uh, لَهُ صَاحِبُهُ His friend, he says to him, وَهُوَ يُحَاوِرُهُ And they were having a discussion. أَكَفَرْتَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَكَ have you, have you done kufr with the one who has created you? I, you believe in him as being your rub? مِن تُرَاب You started with this earth, this same earth that you have your garden from. The same earth that you have your garden from. And you put the plant and the plant comes out and you see this earth. You were created from that same earth. And then from a, a, a murky water or a, a, a minute quantity, quantity of semen. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you a full grown man. So in Arabic language, it means to perfect something to an extent that it is able to perform the obligated responsibility on it. So perfecting someone or perfecting the creation of something to an extent that it is able to perform the required duty or obligation from it. So he's saying that Allah has created you to being perfect so you can, you can fulfill the obligation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the person says, Lakin. Now over here, lakinna was actually lakin ana. Lakin, indeed, ana, me. And because there were two noons, so one of the alifs was dropped and the two noons joined and it became lakinna. So lakin, lakinna, but, but as for me, who Allahu Rabbi? As for me, it is Allah who is my Rabb. Question for you. In the previous one, he talked about Rabb. Creator, because he affirms creation. What has he denied? He has denied the worship or servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why does he bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name over here? Why does he say, Walakinna huwa rabbi? Why does he bring, Walakin huwa Allahu rabbi? Question for you guys. I gave you the answer before I asked the question. Come on, guys. I know you guys are fasting, but like, question to make it clear that it's a lot no 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 uh, close but not so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who Allah Rabbi he is telling the person that I have taken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I believe, you know, Rida, no. So he both believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem in the belief is one says he's my creator, but I'm not going to submit to him. The other says, yeah, he is your creator, bro. I told you he created you from nothing. And as for me, I have taken Allah as my ilah. I have submitted to him as, like I have, so Allah has created me. And then after created me, he obligated me to worship and I have submitted to this obligation. Hence, I have taken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as my ilah. And that's why ilah means the one we worship. 
So, lakin, he says, and as for me, who Allah, I have taken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as my ilah, Rabbi, and he's also my creator. So, we have we have a common ground. Only difference is, I have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala shirik. And I don't worship anyone. Bi Rabbi ahada. With my, with my creator, anyone. I don't do any shirk with my Lord. I, I like... I submit to him, I believe he's my creator, and I don't associate any partners with him, neither in creation nor in servitude, or nor in servicing, uh, having servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he reminds him, Walaula is dakhalt. And as why why was it not that when you entered your garden, Qulta Masha Allah, you should have said, Masha Allah, la quwata illa billah. This is what we talked about previously. If you remember in the previous class, we talked about the culture of Islam. We said, Insha'Allah, Masha'Allah, Bismillah, Subhanallah. These are cultural slogans that we use or sentences that we use that affirm our faith on a consistent basis. So when you see something and you see, oh, Subhanallah, this is so beautiful. When you see somebody has put in so much effort and they have created something so monumental, you don't say Subhanallah for Burj Khalifa in Dubai. You don't look at Burj Khalifa and you say Subhanallah, what beautiful Burj Khalifa. You look at it and you say Masha Allah, right? Because if it was not for the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, He would not have given the human being the brain and the ability to think and to to use all the resources that was given to humans at their disposal, that Burj Khalifa would not have come. But when you go to Niagara Falls, you say, Subhanallah, how beautiful. Like as beautiful as this Niagara Falls, my Rabb is like sanctified that he's only beauty and nothing else. And there's nothing wrong with my Rabb. Because this Niagara Falls tells me that he is pure. Subhanallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَكِنْ هُوَ اللَّهُ رَبِّي وَلَا أُشْرِكُ بِأَحَدًا وَلَوْ لَا إِذْ دَخَلْتَ قُلْتَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهُ There's a hadith by Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, مَا قِيلَ عِنْدَ النِّعْمَةِ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهُ وَلَا تَرَى فِيهَا آفَةً إِلَّا الْمَوْتِ Whosoever he says, at any bounty that Allah gives you, any, whether it is your health, food, today's iftar that you're going to have. If you look at it and you say, Masha Allah, la quwwata illa billah. Two things. Masha Allah, la quwwata illa billah. You say these two things, Allah Prophet ﷺ said, there will be never a time that that, that that bounty will be afflicted with a calamity except death. I, the only thing that will separate you from that bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is death. If you remember to say Masha Allah on that. إِن تَرَنِي أَنَا أَقَلُّ مِنْ كَمَالًا وَوَلَدًا And إِن تَرَنِي And if you were إِن تَرَنِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says And I see you Like I see you أَنَا أَقَلُّ مِنْ كَ Indeed I am As Like Allah So he's saying Bro If you see me As somebody less than you In 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 mal and walad I don't have money And I don't have kids Don't worry فَعَسَى رَبِّي أَنْ يَهْدِيَانِي أَنْ يُؤْتِيَانِي خَيْرًا مِنْ جَنَّتِكَ it's very possible for my Rabb that he can give me better Jannah than you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send down on your garden, the two gardens that you have, husban. And the word husban is a calamity. But let me let me give it in, let me let me explain this to you in your your terms. Uh, like you know, modern day terms. Uh, what's the most famous game that you guys played? I, when I was growing up, it was Counter-Strike. I don't know what you guys have now. Tell me what's a game that you guys play online? The ones with shooting and, 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 and tanks and stuff. Smash Bros? No. Something else. I don't remember the name. I, I, I remember somebody said, <laughs> my uncle plays that. Call of Duty is good. Yeah, Call of Duty is good. And, and, and uh, um, Counter-Strike is good. Fortnite is also good. In all of these games, you know that that razor stri razor strike where you like you have that telescope and you press space bar or something and it goes into more and now you can like point exactly where you want to hit that target, right? That sniper, yes. So that exactly, like Subhanallah, that's the word that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala over here uses. The word husban means that it was a calculated strike on his garden. Like it was not like an adab came to the, the, the whole 
like 10 houses and his house was one of them. Like when the punishment came, يُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهَا حُسْبَان So he's saying, it is very possible for my Rabb to send down husband, to send down just a calculated strike only on your garden. مِنَ السَّمَا فَتُصْبِحَ سَعِيدًا This could become, your, your garden will become سَعِيدًا سَعِيد means like earth, just earth. زَلَقَ Earth that is slippery, i.e. you won't be even capable of walking in your own land. That earth is going to be useless for you. It will be slippery land, barren waste. That's the translation, but I don't think that's right. Sa'idan means earth that is flat. And then zalaqa means it's slippery. So earth that is sa'id, and it's, I don't know if you've ever seen, if, if there is sometimes this clayish, like if you get some, you get soil, you put water in it, and sometimes if you level it or sometimes the right winds blow, it looks like it's perfectly fine earth. The minute you step it, you slip because it's clay underneath. So it's a very thin crust of dried clay on top. It looks like it's perfectly fine dry, but it's you're not even capable of walking on it. And that's that many times where people confuse it and quicksand or something like that. You know, the, 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 the people sink in, uh, if you've heard of that, those are type of the things. So he's saying this earth will become for you, this your land, not even possible for you to walk in it. Or its water, it becomes so sunken into the earth. You will not be able to, you know, even irrigate your plants. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, why did this punishment come to this person? Think about it. He, the punishment came to this person, not because he was a kafir, like I, he was not kafir in the sense of kafir without uh, you know not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kafir in the sense of somebody who denies the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so many people deny the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the reason the mufassirun they have said Ibn Ashur specifically he said why did the punishment come right away because he belittled a believing like he belittled a poor believer think about it for a second never ever look down upon any poor person and not even like any human being, but more so be careful about if he happens to be a believer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test you anytime. And he was surrounded. Now the, the word uhita bi thamarihi is is very in, is indicative of this razor strike that this adab came and it was just on his garden. It surrounded only him. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the word garden? Why did he use the fruits? Because fruits, you know, you could have a garden and if it was not fruitful, then you would not be hurt because, you know, you did not get any fruits. But if you've harvested something, like we, we, have, we have a cherry tree in our, in our backyard. So as it's growing, we're seeing the progress, right? And we're looking forward to it. So when is it painful? When the fruit is ready and tomorrow you go and say, I'm going to go take off that uh, cherries. And that's when it gets punished. Right, that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away. So that this punishment, this adab was to his his fruits, obviously to the garden too, but fruits because that's what it hit his heart. So he started sitting and he started doing this with his hands. Ya Allah, what happened to my thing? He was you know flipping his hands. I've spent so much money and I lost everything. And what we found was this land, this, this garden. So the adab or this punishment came in a manner that if you were to think about it, I'm trying to see if I can find any example to explain, explain this. But I can't. So I'll just use this. This is my, my, my cover for my headphones. So like this is the, the, the roof of something. And then you've got the pillars here, just imaginary pillars. Go along with me, imaginary pillars. You've got pillars here. The adab came from top, so the roof went down. So what happens? The walls collapsed on in on the roof. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say. That this garden, urush means your ceilings, the top of this, you know, the, 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 the ceilings. The garden fell, i.e. the... the the ceiling fell and the garden was toppled on the ceiling. And the person was saying, ya lam ushrik bi rabbi ahada. Question for you. In this whole passage, the person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not talk to us about he was worshipping idols. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even told us that he 
he believed in Allah as Rabb. So what shirk did he do? Where was the shirk? Where was the association? What did he associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I'm waiting for an answer. Yes, no. Are you guys with me? Hello, knock, knock. People alive. He was too proud about his garden and saying that he did not. Uh, yeah, so why was he proud about his garden? Let's, let's go with that. Or, or being proud about a garden, was it, what is that an indication of? That is an indication of love for dunya. And his love for dunya was so much that it's as if it was an association. So he was associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not like, oh, I, I'll worship this. He worshipped dunya to a level that now he is testifies and he says, Walam yushrik, that I wish I had not done shirk bi rabbi ahada with my rabb anyone. And in this case specifically, dunya. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُ فِئَةٌ يَنْصُرُونَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَمَا كَانَ مُنْتَصِرًا وَلَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُ فِئَةٌ يَنْصُرُونَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ And there was nobody that was there to help him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا كَانَ مُنْتَثِرًا مُنْتَصِرًا And nor was he someone that could, like, وَمَا كَانَ مُنْتَثِرًا And he was not supported by anybody. Everybody left him. At that point, Allah reminds you and He says, There, at that moment, when you lose everything in this dunya, when you have nothing left, when nobody supports you, that is the time when a human being remembers that I need to re resort back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about the mushrikun when they are in a ship and when they're in the middle of the sea, they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when Allah puts them in a torment, they, you know, they raise their hands and say, Oh Allah, if you take me out of this torment and this, this storm, I will worship you. And then when he comes back to the land, it's as if the person had never called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Hunalika walayatu. Now the word Hunalika is very interesting. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word Hunalika, always remember in the Quran that what is being said before that is something that you should really take heed. Like listen to it carefully and don't be like that. Hunalika walayatu lillahi al-haq. That, at that moment, that place was al-wilaya or the protection was only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the only support he had was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or only support will come to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huwa khayr. Allahu Akbar. Allah is khayr. Allah is the best. Huwa khayr. Allah is the best. Thawaban as a reward. Wa khayrun. And he is the best. Uqba, the final end or destination. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this example is not enough for us. We got two more ayahs. Allah says, Give them an example of this life. Example of hayat dunya This life of this dunya. It's like water. It's like water we send down from the sky. This water, it, it, it intermingled with the plantation and vegetations of this earth. So it became hashiman draw stalks or dry stalks sorry it became فأصبحها, so it became dry stalk so the, the water came down plants grew it became green harvest happened and now there are dry stalks that, that are generally hay color and some of them have dried up and you see them being flown away with the winds Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of everything Allah is capable of keeping a land completely barren Allah is capable of not giving you a harvest. Allah is capable of keeping something that harvested all the time green, evergreen trees. Allah is capable of everything. All the possibilities Allah is giving you in this surah, in this verse. Then Allah says, Al-Mal wal -banun. What is the moral of all of this for us? Allah says, Al-Mal wal -banun. As for this dunya, the biggest issue that we have is... Al-mal, the money. Wal-banoon. 
and the family and you know life and in in the mufassirun they say in banur children and family and household and car and all of this right money and family and household and children zinatul hayat al dunya remember in the beginning i said this this surah it talks about how dunya becomes a distraction for us so this is the third time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the word zina right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about adornment of life allah talked about yes so allah talked about it in the beginning that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this earth zinat laha whatever is in this earth has been created for you then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wala tamuddayna tamuddanna aynaka ila ma matta'na bihi ila ma matta'na bihi what's the ayah wala tamuddanna aynaka ila ma matta'na bihi zinat al hayat al dunya zinat al hayat al dunya do not extend your eyes to the trinket or the adornment of this life with what we have adorned others with and then over here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word zinatul hayat al dunya the hayat al dunya the life in this dunya what is the summary of the life hadith of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says that whosoever has food for one day malbasu yawmin you have one cloth you are able to cover yourself wa qutu yawmin and you have food you have food for one day and shelter فَكَأَنَّمَا حِيزَتْ لَهُ الدُّنْيَا بِحَذَافِيرِهَا It's as if the whole world has been given to that person with all its trinkets. Everything else other than that, shelter, food, and clothing, everything else, zina. It is adornment. It is extra that we can live without. I can live without this. I can live without my Amazon Echo. I can live without my mic. I can live without my mice, mouse. I can live without this laptop. I can live. My life is not going to be impacted. what are the three things that will impact my life if i don't have a house if i don't have food if i don't have clothes everything else beyond these three things is zina right zina wal baqiyatu salihat beautiful allah ends it what does that mean i want i want i want you guys to bring this out and i'm not going to tell you so allah is saying mal wal banun money and family zinatul hayat al dunya their life they're the intrinclets of this life adornment of this life wal baqiyatu salihat but what will remain what will remain or be enduring or sustained throughout time as salihat what does this tell us about mal and banun if what is going to remain is our good deeds then what is not going to remain mal and banun and zinat al hayat al dunya i e whatever we are running after in this life from having the coolest shoes uh, having the coolest shoes uh, i don't i don't know what ipth means i am or lpth anybody please explain to me i am a miskin and i'm miskin is that mean everything in life everything in this life ipth is that what it means or is that a typo bro i think it was a typo Ah, oh, I'm like you know. Here I am. I'm, I'm like I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling old here. I am old. I got, I got, a, I got a goat beard going. Al mal wal banun zina tul hayat al dunya. The light, this money and al al and children are li- uh, adornment of this life, and they will vanish. They will be obliterated. Yom al qiyama. Everything will be gone. They will not exist. but what will exist wal baqiyatu salihat what will exist is salihat good deeds khayrun inda rabbika thawab they the good deeds are far better with your lords in reward and in hope so in the end of the day we are going to go and meet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we should hope for is we walk away from this dunya with tons of baqiyatu salihat and this is the month where you attain all of this baqiyatu salihat whatever it is kullu ma'ruf in sadaqa every single good deed that you can do in this ramadan go and do it a friend of mine you know he he, he you know he he gifted me um uh, like a, a self help type of a, a cd or something like that back in the day so the person's name was zig ziglar and i learned this from him and he said something so beautiful and i'll end with this he said he said in life if you want to be successful and that's the same formula by the way in dunya uh, in akhira in life if you want to be successful do everything you can and do it the best you can simple 
simple. Don't, don't know, we don't need to complicate things. We don't need to do, right? So every single day when you wake up and you're gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna do everything possible in my head and I'm gonna do it the best you can. Automatically, if you try to do it the best you can, you will not be accomplishing a lot of things, but whatever you would be doing, you would be doing it the best possible. So if you are not perfect reciter of the Quran, no problem, absolutely no problem. Do the best you can. You can read half a page, do it. But read half page. If you're gonna do half page, half page. But make sure you do it the best. Like you put your headphones on, you try your best, you give it your best effort, and you do it that next day, and the next day, and the next day. And remember, in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya will recognize those people that have been practicing things in secret for ages. You will eventually come out and one day people are going to be like, oh, mashallah, look at this person. He is so connected to Quran. His recitation is amazing. X, Y, Z. But you got to put in that effort. All right. On to Instagram. I will see you guys there. I have Instagram right here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk.